I decided now is to spend a few minutes trying to explain to you um, what I think Ackerman does actually. Uh, but before I do that, I have to tell you two stories. The first one is about seedless cherries, and the second one is about millions of dogs and cats being killed every year. Uh, when I was a really long struggling entrepreneur, long before the internet, my wife one day fairly callously said, why don't you do something useful for a living? How about inventing the seedless chair? So being intrepid, I picked up the phone that day while she was at work, and it turned out that the US Department of Agriculture has someone whose job is to answer questions about cherries. Because I couldn't check on the Wikipedia and stuff. And so I spoke to this guy on the phone. He said, making you see this cherry is actually very easy. He said, the problem is, you can't have a cherry without the pit. The seeds inside the pit, they the seed is no problem, but you wouldn't notice it because there'd still be a pit. <laughs> no pit, no cherry. The kind of fruit the cherry is called a droop. And droops have to have pits in order to exist. And what's interesting when you think about that image is that you realize that once you can start and have a nucleus and have a center, it's much easier to have things sort of going around it. The second story that I want to tell you, I promise they'll thread together in a little bit, is about a guy named Nathan Winograd. Nathan uh, was the number two person at the San Francisco SPCA 10 or 20 years ago. And he and his boss, looked at the numbers and realized that every year approximately 4 million dogs and cats were killed by humane shelters around the country. That's their function. They were actually started in New York City and spread around the country to get stray dogs and cats off the streets and kill them. And they're funded by cities to do that. This wasn't okay with David. And he started working very hard to turn San Francisco into a no-kill city. A city where every healthy, non-aggressive dog and cat was actually adopted as opposed to killed. And they went to the San Francisco town, City Council and they tried to lobby for a change in the charter of the SPCA so they could do this. And believe it or not, humane societies from around the country flew to San Francisco to testify against them. To point out that it was impossible and that it couldn't be done and that they were undermining the very nature of their mission. And so, rather than arguing with people, rather than trying to persuade the unpersuaded, Nathan went directly to volunteers. He went directly to people in the community who cared very much about this story. And he told the story to them. And that year, he raised enough money to pay for the whole program, completely with volunteers, and staffed the program with volunteers, and turned the SPCA in San Francisco into a no-kill shelter within three years, from 100% to 4% of the dogs and cats that they, they touch. Well, it's easy to say, well, that's San Francisco. So he left there and went to Tompkins County, New York, which is a rural, blue-collar community near Ithaca. Then he was basically the dog catcher there. And he did it again, within a year, 100% of volunteers. And then he moved to North Carolina, and he did it again. And then he did went to Reno, and he did it again. And the lesson of the story is that Nathan is like the pit. And an entire community then builds up around that first idea that's so hard to do, so hard to do that everyone will come out to challenge it because you're, you're fighting against the status quo. And what I think the Acumen Fund does, it's so different than an aid organization. The aid organization has a finite amount of resources. They go to the endless emergency of poverty. They, they apply the resources. The emergency is saved for a little while, but they're out of bags of rice. And then they have to go do it again. And there's a clear limit to that. And I think that Acumen is doing something fundamentally different. They are not moving money from one pile to another. Now what they are doing is telling a story to some very distinct groups of people. Not to everyone. And that understanding that we don't care about everyone hearing the story helps focus the, the message so much better. So one group of people that Acumen is telling a story to are investors. Investors philanthropists, people who are trying to make change in the world for money. And the message is, we just, we, they, I can keep piling up story after story after story, and over time, it becomes expected that this is possible. There's a second group, the community, the people who send us fellows, people who wanted to see a new way that the world could change, and again, it can coagulate and 
coalesce around this core idea. The next group are the entrepreneurs in the developing world. So that three years ago in Hyderabad, it was really difficult to find someone who graduated from the business school who wanted to devote his or her life to building an organization like LifeSpring. But now it's getting easier and easier. And so one of the tasks that actually has is to throw enough lunches and to throw enough events and to throw enough seminars at the various business schools, at the places where entrepreneurs gather, that they start seeing the story, that they can join the tribe of people who get this story. And then the last group, which is so easy to forget about, is because we're not the government, we have to somehow spread the story to the poor. That the poor of the world have to figure out that it is possible to have a pair of glasses that will let you work 20 more years, as opposed to becoming destitute. That it's possible to irrigate your land and suddenly double your income. How many opportunities are there in the world to go to anybody at any income level and with one device double their income? It's not expected that you can do it. And because it's not expected, people aren't ready necessarily to hear the story. And one of the interesting lessons of the life spring interaction is once life spring realized that the mother-in-law was the person who needed to hear the story, that they needed to build a community of people who would spread that story, it became much easier to grow the business. So just a couple of non secretaries that I want to pile on here, and then I'll try to wrap it up. If you're going to have a tribe, a community of people that share an idea, a movement, and I think that's what activism is becoming, is a movement, you need insiders and outsiders. If everyone is an insider, it's not a movement anymore. It's just everyone. So we need outsiders. We need people who don't get it. We need people who are not going to talk to it. It's fine if we don't go on Oprah ever, because that would be really fun and good for everyone's ego. There's a lot of outsiders there that can't help with the movement. And when there are insiders, the people here, the insiders have a connection, but they also have an opportunity to really push the message forward. And that's how, for example, life spring, spring goes. Someone goes and has a healthy birth. She goes home. Her mother-in-law goes home. Five new people come the next time. That's just not because not life spring went and talked to those people, but because the person who had such a great experience goes and talks to those people. So when we think about the processes that are getting built, and the people that we're investing in, and the kinds of things we're building, a lot of it has to be about which tribe is going to hear about this. How are they going to embrace it? What are they going to talk about when they talk about it to somebody else? And I think we can look through the portfolio that way and really get an understanding of it. So I can talk about this all day, but I'm just going to take the last little part, which is the magic of what's happening in the world today as the world keeps getting smaller, communication gets better, and people in the rural part of India have a cell phone, is that it's even easier than ever. Every day it gets easier for word to spread across the tribe. That groups of connected people can spread word to each other faster than ever. Which means that we have a huge opportunity to make change faster than it's ever been made before. But if you go ahead, fast forward just two minutes, of your train of thought here, what that means is it's not an opportunity at all, that it's an obligation. That if we can do this, we have no choice but to do it. That each of you has a tribe of 20 or 50 or 100 or 1,000 people who trust you, who look up to you, who want to follow what you have to say. And if we all left here and spread the word to them and taught them about patient capital and taught them about how the world is starting to change, think of the impact that that would have. And we need to stop thinking about this mass market opportunity to yell at the world. And we need to start thinking instead about tiny, identifiable groups of connected people that we can tell a story to, so that story will spread. So I want to close by thanking Jacqueline for showing me all of this, for leading, for, for being a hero, and for making such a difference.